Okay, so good morning. Try again. Okay, so this time it works. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the seminar. So before we start off, we just had a small announcement to make because several of you asked us um, when we're going to launch a new call for speakers. So just to let you know that the program is fully booked until end of October, but that we're going to send an announcement for a new call end of May, and that you can start thinking about potential uh, speakers for the, the autumn and the, the next winter, basically. And with that, uh, thanks, Ricardo, for introducing to the speaker. So thank you for coming. It is my great, great pleasure and, and honor, I would say, to introduce uh, Roger Villa. Uh, so Roger is, um, has his degree in uh, biochemistry in 1996. I was one years old uh, in uh, the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. And uh, then uh, he obtained an exceptional uh, uh, degree award. And he also had his PhD in, uh, in, in Spain with another exceptional degree award. And um, he did uh, his uh, uh, postdoc, one of his postdoc actually in a um, in a Harvard University with the, uh, Edward uh, O. Wilson, and for this is uh, all my my envy. I mean, for many other stuff, but for this one especially. Um, so, uh, and then he came back actually to Spain uh, to to found his own uh, his own lab, his own group, and uh, from uh, 2011 he has a permanent uh, position at uh, at the CISIC in uh, in uh, Barcelona uh, at the university. And he runs uh, a lab that studies uh, butterflies and other insects from a really uh, multi-disciplinary, multi-approach uh, point of view. So they study uh, biology of butterflies and insects as uh, 360 degrees. Uh, they're mainly interested in uh, integrative uh, taxonomy, so uh, cryptic species. That's what is going to be the talk um, topic for today. But also uh, uh, by geography and uh, general phylogeny, and they also uh, worked uh, on uh, on uh, biochemistry and other 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 topics in, uh, and uh, always in uh, in the context of uh, insects so Roger the stage is yours and I'm, I'm sure that you'll be a, a wonderful talk thank you so much uh, Ricardo for the presentation uh, thank you Mathieu for inviting uh, thank you everyone for being here so yeah I uh, I like to start my talks with the word biodiversity, because I think this is what uh, we all share as a biologist, a passion for uh, biodiversity, right? And uh, talking about biodiversity, of course, we have to talk about insects because it's about half of the described diversity uh, on Earth uh, uh, are insects. And uh, I, uh, I always like to think, how would an average organism on Earth look like, right? And uh, it would definitely not look like something like that, uh, but it would probably resemble something close to that, you know, because, uh, yeah, indeed, uh, let's meet face-to-face uh, -face, uh, Earth diversity. It looks like that, most of it. And it, uh, insects are one million species described, and uh, estimates vary a lot about how many are still to be described, but a, a reasonable estimate, uh, even conservative, it's like maybe there will be five million, which is... <laughs> So it's a lot. So basically, the, the descriptive uh, challenge is huge that we have ahead. Uh, imagine, I mean, if in uh, 250 years since Linné, we have described 1 million insects and we have to reach 5 million, it will take uh, almost uh, 1,000 years to do the job. Uh, so it's uh, at the current pace. And uh, the most difficult species remain, right? Because the most common ones are already known. So, uh, and then the number of taxonomists uh, seem to decrease, apparently. Uh, also, the descriptive taxonomy, uh, this is, it's obviously not a priority. We know <laughs> that as biologists, uh, uh, you don't publish very high with descriptive uh, taxonomy. 
And also we are facing the highest uh, extinction rate, right? So uh, this looks a bit gloomy. We have uh, some good uh, news and that there are new techniques and methodological advances that help us. There are uh, many of them. I, I would highlight internet and computers. We don't realize how, how much they are helping in everything, right? Also for in taxonomy, also a lot, yeah? So we have information, communication, databases nowadays. And um, let's focus on molecular techniques because uh, this uh, has been a major revolution. You all know, right? Uh, so there has been this eruption of, uh, uh, of uh, genetic diversity and a strange... Uh, um, uh, acronyms, yeah, like, uh, well, Otus, Motus, Yotus, and genetic lineages, bins, and all these things, right? Uh, that has created a revolution. And indeed, it has changed our view of uh, biodiversity in the last year. So the classical view is that we had the described biodiversity, the described forms, and then there were the undescribed forms, right? But the uh, molecular... Uh, results showed us that within the described biodiversity, we still have uh, quite many or some species that were uh, lurking uh, within this uh, already described group that uh, are in fact several species that look the same, right? This is called cryptic biodiversity. I'm going to talk about this. So uh, there are many definition, definitions of crypt cryptic species and most of them they basically refer to the human bias in uh, perception. Uh, but basically, uh, one standard definition is that they are cryptic species are two or more species that were classified as a single one, obviously, because they are morphologically very similar, right? Sometimes identical, synmorphic. And these are some examples of butterflies that have been recognized in the last uh, decades in Europe uh, as cryptic species. Um, all right, so even the classical exploration view that uh, you had to go to very exotic places to find new species, which is still true, right? In the 21st century, it includes, you know, a not so exotic uh, piece of work, which is uh, working in the lab. But yeah, you can also describe new species for Europe or for anywhere uh, just working on the lab nowadays. Um, all right, so let's uh, discuss a bit about cryptic biodiversity. Uh, I will try to address with you some questions, and maybe not uh, give full answers to them because they are hard, but um, okay. So I will talk about what fraction of total biodiversity it represents, uh, how to methodologically approach this enormous this descriptive task, because this uh, the presence of cryptic diversity obviously difficult, the descriptive task, right? Uh, also, how it is generated, the uh, cryptic biodiversity, right? Uh, so then we have to talk about speciation mechanisms, of course. And uh, finally, is it relevant? I mean, why are we talking about it? But is it important? Like, what is the relevance for uh, various uh, research fields? Uh, so are, do cryptic species have any special properties that make them special, <laughs> in addition to the obvious one that they are similar? All right, so let's start. Uh, I will present the work uh, we are doing in our lab, or we have been doing in the past in our lab, uh, the Butterfly Diversity and Evolution Lab at the Institute of uh, Biologia Evolutiva in Barcelona. And uh, the place of the lab is quite special. It's in the, you know, next to the beach in, in, in the center of Barcelona. In summer, it's a bit hard to focus on butterflies here, but uh, no, it's a nice place. Uh, and half of the, our institute is hosted in this marine center and half of the institute is hosted in this uh, <clears throat> uh, medical center. Uh, and they are building a new uh, construction for us only that will be situated like a few streets far from the beach. But still it will be very nice because we will be together in a single beautiful new building, much bigger with a lot of space for everyone. So, Okay, uh, we work with butterflies and use them as a model system for studying diversity patterns and, and processes. And why? Well, butterflies uh, are one of the uh, mega diverse um, orders in, in, the, in the world. Uh, they are, have enormous diversity. They are definitely the best studied invertebrates. This helps a lot because we have a lot of data on them. Uh, they are also bioindicator organisms. 
Uh, this is very important because they are used uh, across the world uh, for uh, monitoring, uh, for example, climate change or any changes in the environment. Uh, they also have a complex ecology as pollinators. They are the main radiation of herbivores on Earth, for example. And another interesting uh, factor is that the chromosomal evolution, they have also very special chromosomes. <coughs> uh, so I will talk about that. Yeah, another interesting <laughs> thing about butterflies is that they are, have a quite a long history. Okay, uh, butterflies have um, more than 100 uh, million years of history. And it was very hard for me to find this image of uh, dinosaurs with flowering plants and uh, some invertebrates, like a, a millipede and here a spider. And, uh, but uh, definitely the author uh, missed that. Um, oops, it's not working. Uh, I don't know why. Ah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> there were some butterflies there. OK. This should be a more faithful image with butterflies around the dinosaurs. And it is interesting to think that the butterflies that are seen as a fragile, beautiful organisms, they resisted what uh, the brute uh, dinosaurs could not, right? And they, <laughs> except for birds, of course. <laughs> well, okay, so the, the first question, how to methodologically approach this uh, descriptive task? Uh, what cryptic biodiversity is there? It's uh, not easy. You know, do we have to revise all the already described species? It's a lot of work. So, and of course it involves uh, money, time, and researchers, which are all limited resources, right? So we have to be very efficient and we have to think on how to do it. And uh, the approach that I have been following, uh, I will show you now. So basically we have to find a method uh, that is useful to uh, study. Mm, so this is a three-dimensional space for molecular studies. I like to think in this uh, in this uh, fashion uh, about uh, the techniques. So you have here a number of markers, number of taxa, and number of specimens per taxon, right? Uh, so for example, phylogeny is quite intermediate, and um, and with phylogeny you you select just uh, some. Usually, I mean, this is the of course only the most usual. Uh, way to use these uh, techniques. So uh, you, of course, you can study evolution in a broad sense and do uh, reconstructions, right? If uh, for population genetics, you, you use only one species or maybe two, but a lot of specimens, right? And a few markers. Then, uh, of course, uh, genomics now it's uh, all over and uh, now it's doing many more things, but in principle, you have few taxa and few specimens because it's expensive, right? Uh, and you get many markers. Uh, on, uh, if you want to study diversity, DNA barcoding is very good because uh, you get one marker basically, but you can study many taxa, many specimens. And when I say many, I, I mean many. <laughs> like I, I want to, so this is uh, the strategy that I have followed in my career. So basically we have been working a lot on DNA barcoding to do wide scale surveys across with the West Palearctic for butterflies. <clears throat> and then uh, this serves as a roadmap to pinpoint interesting potential cases, potential cryptic diversity. And then we can do detailed studies using genomics, integrative taxonomy. So uh, I would like to here show you the, this has been uh, the outcome of 17 years of work on my <laughs> recent career. So this is the atlas of mitochondrial genetic diversity for all Western Palearctic butterflies. <clears throat> These are the co-authors that uh, help mainly on, on this effort. So it's 32,000 specimens of all the butterflies in the West Palearctic, basically, virtually. Uh, these are uh, the distribution of the sequences and the, the distribution of the species. Um, so with this, we get a very clear uh, view of what is the genetic landscape, mitochondrial, okay, but still interesting, of all the species of butterflies in the West Palearctic. And uh, this is available online, and you have one page for each species, and where you get, you can see this, right? 
For each one, you have a PCOA of the genetic, uh, each point is one specimen. Well, here they are pies, so each section is one specimen. Uh, and um, <clears throat> these are haplotypes, in fact. So you get a PCOA, PCOA colored, and then you get the map of genetic diversity. Well, here, for, for example, for this species, Lassiumata majera, we got 388 species, uh, the 47 observed haplotypes. We calculated the estimated number of haplotypes with as, as an asymptote, uh, asymptote. And uh, it's usually much more than we observe, even if we sequenced a lot, because all, of all these low frequency point mutations that exist. Uh, and then we got other uh, interesting indexes like GST and uh, population structuring, these kind of things. And then also for each species, we get the haplotype network. And this is a, a basically a plot where each point represents a different species. And uh, here you get the degree of spatial structure and the degree of genetic variation of each species. So in this case, uh, this species, La Cimata Majera, has quite a lot of uh, spatial structure and quite a lot of genetic variants, right? So this is very useful. And this is a roadmap for research and also for conservation. This is very important also for conservation. I mean, this is just an example of three species in which if we focus on the Iberian Peninsula, we see that the, this is the Ebro Valley, which is uh, very anthropized and low and hot. And so it's a real barrier for some species. And we can see that uh, we get uh, genetic lineages that are different on both sides. Uh, this is also called cryptic diversity, right? Not cryptic species, but cryptic lineages. And who knows, maybe some of them are cryptic species. So these are the kind of things we want to study. Uh, with these kind of studies, uh, we also can estimate, okay, how many species of butterflies have uh, cryptic lineages within, or mitochondrial highly diverse lineages. Uh, basically, these are lineages above 2.5% divergence, and uh, with some methods of uh, species delimitation, like GMYC, or they are highlighted as potential cryptic species or potential genetic diversity that is profound, right? So it was quite a big surprise that we got like 27% of all European butterflies include, uh, almost 30% include uh, cryptic uh, lineages or genetic lineages quite diverse above 2.5%, which is quite a lot. So we have to look at all these cases and think that butterflies are, have been really well studied in, in Europe. I mean, if we compare this to any other insect group that has been much less studied, it would be really uh, uh, a very different result, right? So we got this list that it goes on and on. Uh, these are the top hits of a taxa that uh, have several entities within uh, and then uh, this one has a minimum distance between entities of 4%, 3.8, and it goes low uh, each time lower. But um, so these are cases that are worth studying. There is something interesting in these groups. Not all of them are species. We have studied a lot of them already. Not all of them are species, definitely. There are interesting cases of introgression. There are um, other, other uh, biological mechanisms that are interesting here. But uh, some of them are species, and we showed that. So then we pick some of them and we do detailed studies. Uh, and for that, of course, we'll, we look at how this speciation has been generated, how this, this divergence has been generated, even if it is not yet speciated. Uh, and we have to deal with the uh, speciation mechanisms. So let's talk a bit about that, right? Okay, this is the most uh, famous example of cryptic species in Europe. These are the Leptidea butterflies. These are uh, very slow flyers. Uh, nobody paid attention to them, but until uh, this was uh, in, the, uh, in the, um, about the 1990, someone realized that there are two cryptic species. These were the, probably the two first cryptic species in Europe of butterflies discovered, right? So it has been quite a big thing since then. Basically, these two species, Leptidea synapis and Leptidea reali, uh, they co-occur, but they realize that there are two types, morphological types in the genitalia. You cannot distinguish the external morphology, and uh, you have a uh, long penis uh, males. Uh, sorry, 
long penis males or long phallus males and short phallus males. And then the females have long ductus bursae or short ductus bursae, right? So whoa, it, uh, it, it was clearly then backed with a molecular study. So we had these two cryptic species flying together. It was a very interesting system. And then we came and with these studies, uh, molecular studies, and we did some phylogenies, and we were truly surprised that what this is one of them, and this is the long phallus group. And this long phallus group, it was paraphyletic, super strong, super clear. There were two things here that actually between them are parapatric. So we discovered the third species. So within this, um, well, it was quite quite clear. So basically, we got triplet in this case. And uh, this came in 2011 and quite a big surprise because for like two decades, there has been studied as a model of cryptic species. And uh, nobody realized it was hiding a third cryptic species within them. Well, I remember that when I talked to, to someone that uh, did um, Magne, Magne Friber, who had, did his PhD, the whole PhD on this pair of species, of course, he was in, in Scandinavia, and there, there is no reality, but he, he did some studies across Europe. I told him, no, no, but there is a third species. He, he said, no, no way, it's impossible, but it is. And you cannot distinguish them. This is the, except for uh, morphology, right? Uh, except for molecular analysis, sorry. So they are totally symorphic, even in the genitalia, these, these two. Okay. Well, so of course, uh, many, oops. Ah, no, there is some delay. Uh, there has been many studies with this um, since 2011 with this group. Uh, why, how did this speciate, right? Uh, what are the mechanisms? What are the factors behind these uh, species? The, the first obvious experiment is about reproductive uh, isolation. This was done in Sweden uh, because these uh, species have a very special courtship in the wild. Uh, basically, I will show you now, but the, the male uh, sits in front of the female, it uh, elongates the proboscis and moves the head from side to side, uh, moving the proboscis between the antennae of the female for quite a while. I sometimes get bored in the field, like waiting, like, come on, yes or no, yes or no. And the female is thinking, 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 you know? And uh, so these are so tame, these butterflies, that you can like present, introduce one to the other in the lab on, on top of cotton buds. You know, you put them in front and wait and they start the ritual and you see if they mate or they don't, right? Mm -hmm. So basically here, you can see what happens. <laughs> I cannot talk with the music because it uh, reverberates. But basically, this is a Spanish macho. This is a Swedish uh, female. Let me start again because I want to explain you what's going on here. So basically, you see the male, it moves the head and the uh, elongated proboscis, and it's trying to, the male, the female is thinking. Now you see the female. It's uh, showing the tip of the abdomen. It says, yes, let's mate. But the male doesn't realize, unfortunately. <laughs> it's uh, too excited. <laughs> and he goes on and on. And she's like, come on. And she flaps the wings. He was like, come on. <laughs> and no. And uh, well, unfortunately, mm, this didn't end well. You will see soon. Uh, so you see, in this case, uh, he finally tries, but she got already bored. And now they, she flies away. <laughs> so <laughs> OK. So you can do a lot of replicas like that. And uh, the results were super clear. So basically we did it with a lot of different populations, Spain, Sweden, and Kazakhstan, Ireland. And uh, basically all the intraspecific, like there was high rate of acceptance. And all the heterospecific, there was zero acceptance. Never a female in the lab accepted a male that is not the correct male. Uh, so probably here there is uh, some chemical, of course, going on, some chemical signal. So uh, and this is interesting. We studied also a bit the chemistry, and it's very subtle, this chemical difference. So it seems to be significant, but very subtle. So maybe there is something specific in the proboscis. Uh, so it's not a pheromone that is uh, very evident. And that's why also the females sometimes think for, for quite a long time. Uh, to decide. Okay, so we know that uh, there is a chemical communication involved in the speciation here. And uh, another interesting uh, factor uh, for this uh, case 
is chromosomal instability. I mean, in butterflies, you find some groups that are really unstable chromosomally. Uh, they have uh, allocentric chromosomes um, that uh, are a bit more of a variable, so they allow for some degree of uh, variability within the populations in some, in some cases. But uh, the case of Leptidea is really striking. I mean, uh, this is a tree of the genus, and here you see that uh, they range, like uh, these species have a 200, um, uh, deployed the number, and well, some uh, some have a huge interpopulational um, uh, variance, right? Uh, in this case, for example, the Leptida synapsis is famous because it's a cline across the Palearctic. It starts in the west with a very high number, and it decreases uh, to the to the west, uh, to the east. Sorry, until Kazakhstan, you know. So. Uh, another interesting surprise, well, this uh, system was a bit like a magic. Every different researchers have been looking at it at different aspects and almost everything they looked at was, wow, this is so cool. So, so cryptic species sometimes, and I would say most of the times, they, they hide a lot of interesting stories. So I hope that this is a good example for you because this is a, uh, so uh, uh, this group uh, in the Czech Republic, um, Frantisek Marek and, and uh, Sichova, uh, they uh, studied the, the chromosome constitution, and it was a big surprise that each of the three species has a different combination of multiple sex chromosomes. So butterflies are WZ, normally, that's the normal thing. In this case, we got up to four Z and four W, which is like, what is going on? This is not known in any animal except for the platypus. That is a similar case with uh, XY, right? So it uh, was really surprising. And for sure, this was also a factor uh, that avoids, uh, uh, that uh, it was involved probably, probably in speciation, right? So it has to be taken into account. In fact, the two that are um, uh, sim uh, sympatric, and, and most recently, they birthed Reali and Synapis. They have the most difference in the number of, of sex chromosomes. Hmm. Maybe there is something there for sure. I mean, then there are all the usual suspects like, uh, like Wolvachia. Wolvachia is an endosymbion that infects many insects. They say that it's probably in 70% of the insects that they have been tested. So, which is huge. Right? We're talking about 700. Uh, thousand species in the world, right? It's a lot. Uh, it's a bacterium that lives intracellular and it creates a reproductive manipulation, uh, usually cytoplasmic incompatibilities that, of course, represent a partial barrier uh, to reproduction. Uh, so this also uh, could be a factor and indeed in many cases is a factor. And in the case of Leptidia, again, we find this is an unpublished result since a long time. We <laughs> hope it will be published soon. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, you see that, for example, uh, some species are not infected, but uh, some are infected, and some share the same strain. So this strain has been jumping within this group, and some other species have other strains. So, but uh, it's quite clear that it could have a potential in effect uh, acting as a barrier. So which of all these factors have been working in the speciation process? Uh, probably several together, right? I mean, we don't have a time machine to go in the backwards to see what happened at the beginning, but uh, nowadays there are all these factors potentially involved in encrypted speciation. All right, so well, female image choice, chemical presigotic barriers, genitalia lock and key, you know, the long follows and short follows, they may have some, mechanical problems, right, uh, to cross uh, mate. Well, karyotype instability, sex determination systems, Wolvachia infections. So a lot of things going on with a, a single system. All right, so cryptic species are very good models to study speciation, that's, that's for sure, we can say that, all right? And uh, in fact, uh, there is a growing Leptidea community of researchers that have been uh, doing their research on, on these uh, small group of species. And uh, uh, nowadays, uh, of course, uh, Nicholas Backstrom has been working a lot on the genomics uh, approach to this study, uh, to this uh, system. 
uh, there have been very interesting contributions and quite many more are coming and will be published very soon uh, on the genomics of a speciation with this uh, triplet of species. And uh, for example, that uh, there is basically lack of gene flow nowadays. So, well, we expected that because the females don't accept the males, but, uh, but also it was interesting that uh, there was a differentiation islands were very narrow and dispersed and uh, not, not many, it was surprisingly low across uh, all these comparisons, right? All right, so if we look at the diversity of butterflies, just let's think about Europe, for example, like um, how many how many interesting questions are looking are here, and how many cryptic species, and you know, one what different factors in each case are all more or less the same factors, or are they different? I don't have time to talk about the many studies we have been doing with several of them, but I will show you talk about a couple more examples a bit uh, briefly. Oh, one of them is this one, so which is the genus uh, uh, Spialia. And this is the Spialia sertorius, this beautiful little butterfly. You, it also flies uh, out here. Uh, oops. Ah, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was highlighted as a highly divergent in mitochondria, also one of these uh, top hits of something maybe interesting in this species. So that's why we looked at it. And uh, well, basically, the initial, this is a phylogeny. Uh, of the of the group in the in with the West Palearctic, and uh, the initial idea was that we had two species, right? With a parapatry in Central Europe, Spialia sertorius in the in the West, Spialia orbifera in the East. This was the classical view since 2016, quite recent. Then the first surprise is that there were no. There were two cryptic species within Spialia sertorius that they are allopatric. Spialia ali in North Africa, Spialia teramne in uh, Corsica and Sardinia. Right? Uh, okay, that was already some cryptic diversity there, but there was a, a third, a third group. Ah, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, a third potential cryptic that uh, we call it Spialia rose for obvious reasons that will become now soon apparent. Uh, that it's in sympathy with um, Sertorius is really close. And uh, it occurs in the Iberian Peninsula only. We were a bit surprised about that and like, mm, why? Um, could it be another cryptic species? So we look, well, this is the CO1. Interestingly, the mitochondrial, it's closer to the Eastern one than to the Sertorius, which, uh, you see here, this is Rose, this is uh, Sertorius, and this is the Eastern one, and the CO1 is quite close to that one, right? Uh, but then we look at many things without much results. Uh, ITS, wing, some nuclear markers were not variable. You cannot distinguish Rose and Sertorius, which are morphologically identical in both external, internal, so, we couldn't find what's going on that with these two in sympathy in the Iberian Peninsula, Sertorius and Rosé. They were identical morphologically, they were identical in the nuclear. Only the C1 was different. What's going on? We checked the karyotype, the chromosome numbers. All the species in the group have the same karyotype, 31 chromosomes. Uh, so, what? So, the answer, ah, this is interesting. We looked at the chemical profile, and this was a bit of a surprise. Well, Quite a surprise because the rose was very different from the rest, right? So rose is here, and uh, this is a uh, Sertorius and uh, Orbifer. The other, these are the three that are close, and these two are the the identical morphologically uh, and, and in sympathy. So it smelled different and quite different. It had a lot of strange compounds. Hmm, there is something. So at some point, the answer came through ecology in this case, right? So all these species. Where are known to be monophagous on Sangisova minor. Mm -hmm. One day, uh, the, uh, the PhD student in the field, he found one female boom, laying an egg on a rosa. Like, what? Can it be a reposition mistake? Some female butterflies, they do a reposition mistakes, right? So, <laughs> so we try to see what happens. And, uh, but the, um, 
indeed it was the larva was feeding on it and we sequenced it and it was this strange now we call it rose lineage mitochondrially hmm bingo there could be this could be the answer maybe there has been a host plant shift in sympathy so we rushed to the field to try to get many in sympathy in the two plants right the, the, the plants are really near like one is uh, on the ground the other is a bit uh, small bush so and uh, the problem is that it was already autumn we got a, a blizzard and a very bad weather so we spent there with the red hands looking at all these small plants uh, but we could find enough uh, larvae in sympathy in both plants because they, could, they do some refugia so they spend the winter as larvae so we could find them here you see uh, one of these larvae feeding on rosa it had never been reported before that they can use this plant it was quite a big surprise and finally the answer is yes uh, uh, across the uh, iberian peninsula we have uh, gathered a lot of uh, samples in the two on the two plants and uh, it's 100 percent so rose never has been found on sanguisorba uh, the species are determined by co1 and uh, uh, Resertoris has never been found on Rosa in sympathy. So there is this correlation, perfect correlation that doesn't make sense unless they are two species, right? Because it's unlinked why the mitochondrial should correlate with host plant in sympathy, in synchrony, uh, exactly at the same place. Uh, so we have the new species for Europe. Uh, and this is a case of a speciation linked to host plant shift. So another factor to take into account is cryptic species sometimes. All right, uh, then we looked at the genomics of the, of the system, and uh, it also came quite a big surprise that, that uh, Spialia rose, and also here, and also the Calabrian uh, orbifer, um, ah, sorry, Calabrian, Sicilian, sorry, Ricardo, <laughs> Sicilian um, orbifer, uh, they are, uh, they show very, clear signs of a genetic admixture. So there has been hybridization here in progression, and we tested uh, with uh, ABBA-BABA tests, and it uh, was significant. So we see that uh, Rose is a species of hybrid origin, right? This, every time, uh, it is becoming more, we are realizing that is pervasive in nature. Uh, the more we have data on genomes, the more we see that there are some specific populations that they have a hybrid origin. They may be already species or they may not. We hard to say. For example, these ones in Sicily, okay, they are just considered subspecies or interspecific variability. They are a bit different. Uh, just at this, this point, we have seen that there is some kind of a character displacement on the genitalic uh, structures, so they tend to be different in the Messina Strait, where uh, Sertorius and, and Orbifera are in contact. They tend to be more different than the genitalia in this place, so some speciation in CPN is going on there. But the origin of it, it's introgression, apparently. So introgression uh, has been traditionally regarded as a method to, to avoid divergence, because it fuses back in secondary contact, it fuses back the lineages, right? But it's also, uh, we're realizing it is really fueling and creating divergence many times because if it is introgressing, for example, there is some kind of introgression or hybridization in a specific uh, population, this population, it can become quite different from the rest of the same species. So, and uh, eventually it can even speciate. So it's creating all these uh, quite melting pot of, uh, uh, of different populations that eventually may speciate or not. All right, uh, this is, uh, of course, a big problem for taxonomy <laughs> because if you have gene flow and hybrids and it's hard to put names to species, it's very hard. And uh, almost every study we do now, we see some population that has some hints or that it has some uh, genetic uh, component in the, in the genome that comes from another species like we do with uh, Neanderthals, right? <laughs> All right, I will talk to you now about the uh, final case, uh, which is the Ificlides, that um, this beautiful butterfly, uh, it was uh, thought to be a single butterfly, Ificlides podalirius, the scarce swallowtail, 
uh, with two subspecies. And the contact zone is not far from here, in fact. So here you have podality already, uh, as in the rest of the Paleartic, uh, but uh, in the Ot Valley uh, to the south, uh, to the south uh, there is this other subspecies that is called Fistamelli. So we studied this case in, in detail and, okay, uh, to explain a long story short, one of the interesting factors that we have not yet discussed in this talk is that, uh, so quite surprisingly, the males uh, have a very different UV reflectance on the white of the wings, of the upper side of the wings. Uh, this is not the case so much on the females. So this species is a bit more yellowish, and that was known, and this is a bit more whitish, and you can see this difference here, but in the UV, uh, in the male, is super clear. Uh, it has a very strong difference and, and it's uh, very consistent. Uh, so potentially, uh, females can choose uh, the male. This is not yet proved. We hope to do it at some point. Females could, could potentially choose the male based on the UV reflectance, right? It's uh, something that we as humans don't perceive and they look quite similar, but to them, maybe they look strikingly different to the, to the female's eyes, right? So this is another factor that can uh, be working on the speciation of critically species. And uh, finally, uh, of course, uh, a next step is doing comparative genomic approach uh, to uh, cryptic biodiversity. This is what uh, Conrad Loss is doing with uh, his uh, ERC grant. Um, he has been sequencing all the pairs of uh, cryptic or recently speciated species across Europe. And uh, this is, well, here, this is some example of cases of uh, parapatry. These were the spialia we just talked about. These are the ificlides we just talked about, and uh, many others. And for example, this, uh, in this uh, paper, the, we estimated the, the time, the age of the initial divergence. And it was quite a surprise that they are very old, all these pairs. I mean, we all thought that, okay, the last glaciation, the, if not the last, the previous, but recently they split. No, no. I mean, the average is about 3 million years, the initial divergence between these lineages, right? It, uh, there are a few cases that go to less, to around 1 million years, like Leptidia, again, the record. But, um, but some go to 8 to 9 years, uh, 9 million years, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, all these cases uh, predate the, all the glaciation, the Pleistocene. So, we, we were thinking about the Pleistocene species pump as a mechanism with the glaciations and post-glaciation to create species. Uh, but the surprise is that most lineages are uh, originated before the glaciations. Of course, the, glaci the glaciations helped in this process. Of course, I mean, they probably completed all this speciation. But the original split is old, quite surprising, for example. So I'm sure that many interesting things will come out uh, for, with this comparative genomics approach. And um, well, I think we have talked uh, enough about position mechanisms. Um, how are we about time? Perfect. <laughs> well, let's go for the last question. The relevance for various fields, right? So what is the relevance of a cryptic diversity? It's just that I like it, or is it worth studying it, right? Well, uh, there are obvious fields that, that of course, uh, it's, it's important for them. Uh, obviously, taxonomy. Uh, if you describe the species, obviously, taxonomy. Conservation, for sure, for sure. We got many cases that of uh, an endangered species, species that it, it, has, it, it has some cryptic, cryptic diversity in it, and then they have to be independent management units. You cannot merge them and they become even much more threatened, each of them, because the, the range is even smaller than previously thought, right? Or um, these cases, uh, of course, there are great models to study species and um, also interesting evolutionary ph phenomena, even if they are not species, right? Like for like infections, introgression. So, but the question here is, do they have any particular properties like uh, are they that can make them important? To, to take them into account in, in biogeography, in ecology, studies of climate change. So in other words, basically we're asking the question, is cryptic biodiversity 
or the critic diversity, an homogeneous subset of diversity beyond the fact that they are morphologically similar. Well, yes, yes, there are several, several properties. One, of course, they are congenetic, of course. I mean, they are closely related. Yeah, of course. But quite surprisingly, more, many times they are not sisters. They are not sister. They are quite diverse. Uh, one clear case is the Polymatos Icarus and Chilina. They are this, the common blue. They are very widespread across Europe and North Africa. And they are parapatric. Uh, and they, their divergence is quite, quite high. And uh, Icarus has speciated uh, since the split in, uh, for example, this one that is a high mountain specialist that it's much paler the blue. Right, it has one generation, it has shifted their color. So it's a clear species it was. This was described a long time ago versus this. And then more recently we discovered that there is this, another one that is an ecological equivalent, but not sister. And this is happening many times. We have found it uh, like these two, Agestis and Cramera, again, are parapatric. They have a uh, very similar ecology. And, uh, but one of them is sister to high mountain species. So, it's so old that there has been further speciation going on. All right, another interesting property is that in a few cases they co-occur, but most of the times they don't. They have checkered distributions. They, mm, the presence of the other species in many cases is a strong factor that the other would, the, the species will not be there. So uh, these are just uh, some ecological niche modeling. And you can see that climatically, uh, the, the common blue should be in Sicily because climatically it's identical to, to Calabria, right? And, uh, but on the contrary, there is only Chilina and vice versa, right? Chilina is not there, but climatically it should be. And um, this is a nice view of the Messina Strait uh, where uh, this is mainland, this is Sicily, and it's uh, taken from Mount Dinamare. And uh, this is three kilometers only. We were going there, everyone thought that it was only Icarus, okay. We started sequencing, and on this side, it's only Icarus. On this side, it's only Chilina. And we sequence many, and it's like this. So here, obviously, there is some kind of uh, um, interference between the two species. There is a species interaction, obviously, that for some reason they don't like to core core. Probably there is a reproductive interference if one Icarus flies across, uh, then it will find the other species. If it cannot recognize them well, the hybrids will have a problem. Even if it recognizes them, it will not find their mates, or it will be very hard because they will be highly diluted in this high population of these other species. So this is a, a very common. And then uh, we looked, okay, so what is the distribution of these species in space, right? It was quite a surprise that it is about 25% across all Europe. So we define what are cryptic species. We define cryptic species as are uh, products of splits into several species. Since 1970, there was this revision of classical uh, morphology, very clear. And since then, there has been quite some surprises. You know? So all these uh, groups uh, represent about 25% of the butterflies known nowadays. And they are very evenly distributed. Right? Well, but interestingly, if we look at the concurrence by the Sorensen index, the cryptic, they don't concur much, right? We know that there are a few cases that do, but most of them, they don't. So cryptic species share a significantly smaller fraction of the distribution, right? And this has uh, some implications. For example, for beta diversity, if we study beta diversity turn turnover on islands, because the first that arrive on, I, on an island, the first takes all the island, and then the other cannot colonize it. Uh, each island harbors a different species. They have these checkered distributions on islands. And uh, the beta diversity, it's huge, hugely caused by cryptic species. It, it reaches 75, 18, 100% of the turnover in all these islands is due to these cryptic species. Because uh, most of the uh, species that reach the islands are generalists, so the, the rest don't, don't contribute so much. There is not so much endemicity on these islands. But uh, so if uh, someone is studying uh, diversity, turnover, biogeography, 
it's really important to take into account cryptic species if you, especially if you are dealing on island, right? Uh, in, on the contrary, on mainland, they are frequently parapatric, right? They have a, this is an example with these two, uh, Richie Gestis, Richie Cramera. They have a, this contact zone exactly in my house, <laughs> which is very fortunate because I can study the, <laughs> I can study the system very well. Uh, and, and interestingly, there has been uh, like more than 50 kilometer northward shift in the last century in this place. Uh, so it seems that uh, climate change is really affecting because they have this um, uh, interference. They cannot co-cool. If one is slightly better adapted to cold and the other slightly better adapted to hot, for example, one wins the other in, in some situations. If there is climate change, this contact zone is shifting quite clearly. Uh, there, are uh, there are other cases that have been shown uh, of uh, shifting in, in contact zones of uh, parapatric species uh, across Europe or the UK, for example, because of climate change. So important, again, uh, we are missing the impact of climate change on cryptic species because all this monitoring that has been doing to estimate uh, as bioindicators the, the, the impact of climate change on butterflies, for example, I mean, they don't take into account cryptic species because they cannot recognize them in the field. It makes sense. I, I'm not saying it's easy, but we are missing a fraction of the effects, right? So the effects of climate change are bigger than we imagine. Yeah, I'm about to finish. <laughs> In fact, let's wrap up. <laughs> okay, so just to uh, summarize. So what fraction of total biodiversity is cryptic? I would say that for insects in groups that are not super studied like butterflies, surely more than 25%. There is a lot, I think. Um, how to methodologically approach this in a group that has not been very well studied, for example? Well. I would say that first do a wide scale survey and then do detailed case studies with genomics and integrative taxonomy. So how much should we invest in deeply studying each taxon? Because some of these examples, the Spialia one, it took us eight years to figure out the, that was the host plan that was exactly demonstrating it afterwards. So it's a lot, unfortunately, many times it's a lot of work. You look at many factors are not showing any signal until you find some factor. Uh, and how is it generation, uh, generated? Well, we know now that there are many potential factors. Uh, hybridization is an important factor that is emerging that we have to be uh, aware of it. Uh, and they use a varied disposition mechanism that uh, vary from species to species, right? And they are, yes, they are very important for some fields uh, of research. So they are great models, of course, but they are not an homogeneous subset. They are frequently parapatric. They, they are important to be uh, included in large scale studies, even if it's not easy. And uh, for conservation, by geography, evolution or ecology, they can be very important. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, So if someone has uh, some questions, feel, feel free to ask, and I'm sure there's, there's a lot of questions. Hi, hello, hello. Well, it doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk, it was very nice. I was wondering, even when you said that they are not sister species, there is some kind of phylogenetical phylogenetic signal involved, maybe. So I was wondering what what is happening with these traits that make this species cryptic. Uh, do do we know if there is some kind of uh, relaxed selection in uh, some of the species and positive selection in the other one, or in completely not certain involved? Do we know something about the? Yeah. Cryptic traits. Yeah, I mean, they are not sister because they are old, and then some of them speciated, speciated further. So I think that the main mismatch is ecological speciation, which can be very fast, versus allopatric speciation. I would say that most of these cases were initially 
uh, allopatric speciation. So they stayed separate for a long time and they had stasis in morphology, morphological stasis and psychological stasis. Like there were some generalists, for example, or, you know, but they were not in contact. And then in, within each of them, there can be some fast ecological speciation that is going fast because of high altitude versus low altitude, some things like that. But uh, then there is secondary contact and then this create these parapatric uh, systems. But um, my impression, especially looking at the age, that it goes more than th around 3 million years, it, it's probably that they have been in a lot long time. So, and they just didn't change because they were doing well. Many of these are generalists that they are at lowland and uh, probably they just didn't change. Then when they met, well, we have a problem here. We have been apart so long that we have some uh, interference in the hybrids have some problems, uh, but uh, we don't recognize each other. We fit on the same thing. We, in many cases are like this. Then of course there can be other cases, but I don't know, that's my, I, my take. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Vanina. Hi. Hello. Uh, I would like to know how many cases did you have in your large screen of uh, DNA barcoding of sister species that were not uh, monophyletic for uh, DNA barcoding? Ah, yeah, good point. Good point. Because uh, DNA barcoding is mainly used as an ident identification tool. Uh, so if uh, they are the species are clearly monophyletic, then it's easy to use this to determine anything, eggs or larvae or uh, any uh, stomachal content of a predator. So you can determine, use it as a determination tool. But um, of course, the species that share haplotypes, then we have a problem there that are not monophyletic, for example. Uh, and uh, it was uh, only 10% of the species shared haplotypes, 90, more than 90%, I think it was, uh, they can be identified. And the ones that cannot not be identified, it's always between two closely related species, usually uh, that have some introgression sometimes, or that there is no, there has not been uh, independent lineage shorting because it's too recent. Yeah, so this is the answer, 90%, which is quite good for butterflies. I mean, in general, yeah. No other questions? <laughs> so I maybe have one. All right. Um, <laughs> I kind of, uh, I mean, during your talk, we kind of understood that uh, to address this problem of, of uh, uh, describing cryptic, cryptic diversity and in general describing the diversity in taxonomy, you really need to do uh, a work that can be long, but uh, uh, is necessary to fully discover uh, the, the the whole picture of the diversity of of, of a group, uh, especially a complex one like Leptidia butterflies or others. Yeah. So, what do you think um, about the kind of recent uh, uh -huh. uh, techniques that have been proposed to address uh, this problem? So, you proposed uh -huh. a solution that requires a lot of time, but uh, uh, I mean, manages to have very good results. Mm -hmm. uh, some other people like proposed uh, what I call the shotgun description. So, uh, uh, mm -hmm. three percent divergence. Just, okay, new species. Three, yeah? Okay, new species. Yeah. So what do you think about it? <laughs> I expected this question <laughs> because now it's in, uh, there is a big debate about, uh, okay, it, we have to describe so many things in the tropics and in some groups that are not well studied at all that let's just use CO1 and above 3%, 2.5, whatever threshold we use, everything we describe it as a species. We don't have time to look at the morphology. We don't have time to look at the exact, you know, detailed studies. Well, it's a trade-off, right? Between putting a lot of effort to do a good job or making a lot of uh, false, uh, des describing a lot of false species or a lot or uh, some false species. Uh, I'm sure that CO1 is not enough to describe species. CO1 alone or mitochondrial alone. Because we, in these top hits of a high divergence, we got many cases, uh, maybe half of them are, are not species. Now we know it's an introgression from another one in some region, uh, or um, 
or some uh, some other factors like uh, Wolbachia, it's inherited uh, maternally, so it correlates very well with the C1. And uh, Wolbachia has these these sweeps in the population. It, when there is an infection, it expands uh, because it has an advantage um, because of the plasmatic incompatibility. So it is expands, and the lucky female that got infected, this CO, this uh, mitochondrial um, haplotype or, or uh, form across all the region until there is a barrier in uh, like a sea strait or a mountain right so still you see a lot of uh, geographical structure but but it's because of the expansion of the infection so and in these cases it creates these huge uh, uh, deeply diverse lineages that they are not species in many times in many cases so I would I would not describe species with co one only I know that it's it would make life so much easier. And as biologists, we would want to think about the, the nature being simple and some magical rules, but nature is complex. <laughs> it's like that. Yes. So in the case of the your second case with the Rosa, yes. Rosa yeah. it's only the CO1, but it's a species because it's with an Ostwanzli shift, isn't it? Well, uh, initially we were, at some point we were sure because in sympathy it correlates perfectly statistically. We have 100 cases and that always CO1 correlates with Ostwan, which there is no reason why. But the nuclear are, are no different. At that moment, the nuclear were not different because we just had some data. Now we have we uh, we have uh, genomic data and it's confirmed uh, okay. that they are different. But interestingly, there is this integration uh, from the east also, so it has some hybrid origin there also uh, behind. Uh, there are other factors there. One more factor, well, the chemistry that they smell different. So there is something there because they are in sympathy. Probably it comes from the host plant because if they eat different host plant, they have different chemicals. But uh, another thing that Wolbachia seems to be their uh, factor. Spialia rose is always infected, always. Spialia sertorius is never infected. So mm, there is also something going on there. So if there's no other questions, thank you. And uh, uh, if um, someone wants uh, to um, to talk with uh, Roger this afternoon, uh, is uh, at the CEF in my office, uh, so you can come and uh, and uh, discuss with him. Thank you.